Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your exchange's senior enlisted advisor. Today, we have two special guests. But before we get to them, let me introduce my co-host, Julie Mitchell. Julie, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Chief. Good to see you again. Hey, let's get this going. I know uh, um, I'm excited for what I'm about to hear today. So can you please introduce our guests? You got it, sir. We have two terrific guests today. They both defended our nation through their distinct military careers. Now they are working to help soldiers, airmen, and military families in times of need. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome Lieutenant General Retired Raymond Mason, Director, Army Emergency Relief, and Lieutenant General Retired John Hopper, CEO, Air Force Aid Society. Thank you. Hey, and if y'all are watching, um, this is a, a recorded interview, but you can still leave comments and questions and our team will get it addressed. And if we don't know the answer, we'll find out. We want this to be as engaging as possible, even though we weren't able to be live. So if you're not following our page, you, you should, because we have chief chats at least twice a week and you want to be able to keep up to date with who's coming up next. So if you're not following us, I have to ask, why not? Hey, let's get this going. Lieutenant General Mason, Lieutenant General Hopper, so good to see the both of you. I, I believe the last time I saw you was about a year ago in Dallas headquarters. Yeah, we did a call. You there. Yep. That's, that's right. We sure did. So now we're doing it virtually due to you know, the global pandemic. But can you tell us where you're coming to us from and, and how you've been doing? Well, I'm, uh, I'm standing here in my office in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, AER's national headquarters. About 30 of us work here. Most of all of us, most all of us are doing teleworking. In a couple of days, people come in and take care of some business, but teleworking has been working just fine. So then we have about uh, 200 folks in the field. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but good. Thanks for doing this, Chief and Julie, and look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm, I didn't drink last night, but it, why is it blurry? I can't. What's going on? <laughs> well, that sounds like a personal question, Chief. <laughs> I'll talk to you, you about look a little that blurry. <laughs> your analysis. Yeah, did you say did you say that, Chief, because it's unusual that you didn't drink last night? Or <laughs> oh, no. oh, okay. John, you never miss a beat, my friend. You are on it. Oh, these generals, oh, they're gonna get me. Hey, these generals Chief, are gonna get me. Chief, that's called an L-shaped ambush, buddy. When you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, you know, in, in case you forgot, you know you're dealing with, with two guys who, who grew up in households headed by career Army NCOs, right? You remember that part? I, I, do, I do remember that. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to get schooled today. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hold your own, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, G General Hopper, please, what about you? Where are you coming yeah, from? And so much like uh, General Mason and AER, we have a, a very aggressive work from home program going. So today is my work from home day. So uh, I'm uh, up on the uh, fourth floor in our townhouse in Alexandria, Virginia, which is supposed to be my floor, but it doesn't really work that way. So uh, <laughs> this is more like my little nook uh, to work from. But uh, we have about 20, 21 people or so in our office uh, four contractors. So at any particular time on a normal work day, uh, we'd have about 20 to 22 folks in uh, doing the work of, uh, of the Air Force Aid Society. So ironically, uh, really, we're literally about four blocks down the street from uh, from General Mason. So <laughs> we collaborate all the time and it's uh, it's even easier when you can throw things to get their attention. Yeah. Wow. So, hey, so to get it started, Go ahead, sir. Sorry. I was just say we meet down at Buffalo Wild Wings, which was in. Kind of, you know, <laughs> that, that actually sounds delicious right it now. Is. Some wings. <laughs> so, General Hopper, you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, your military career, and why did you choose a life of military service? Sure. Yeah, you bet. Well, I'm I'm uh, the son of the South, and as I said, uh, I grew up in a house with uh, with a career Army uh, NCO for a dad, uh, but I was born in Clarksville, Tennessee. So, uh, home of the mighty 101st, uh, Screaming Eagles. Ryan and, uh, but uh, parts, uh, it, it really is the roots of my, uh, my dad's family. Parts of the post are, are uh, occupy the cemetery where my great, great, great grandfather is, uh, is buried. Wow. So, pretty close ties there. But uh, spent most of my life there, a couple of stops in uh, Germany when I was a kid. Uh, we lived in Darmstadt. Uh, I can remember walking up the hill to the old concern up there 
bagging groceries at the commissary. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, ended up uh, going to the Air Force Academy and, and uh, spent four undistinguished career uh, years as a cadet. And uh, then on to pilot training, uh, C-130s in Southeast Asia and uh, graduate school and back out to the academy for a bit and uh, the normal staff sort of stuff. And uh, I ended up uh, uh, back at the academy uh, as the commandant for a while, uh, which was uh, was a pretty yeah. exciting exciting time in our career. I, I usually describe it as 4,000 sets of raging hormones trying to ruin a mediocre career, which uh, <laughs> Sorry. was uh, sort Sorry. of what it was like. Uh, but uh, time on the joint staff and on the joint staff, I, I uh, worked with a number of great officers, but one that General Mason, I'm sure, knows uh, who was, I think, the senior logistician in the United States Army at the time, uh, General John Cusick, and a terrific officer and a great guy, and really enjoyed working with him. But uh, And then moved down to uh, for my final assignment as the vice commander of our training command down in San Antonio. And, Texas, and uh, I do miss uh, Texas at times, uh, although it's hot enough here in Virginia this week that I'm not missing Texas all that much. But I retired in 2005, and I've been working for the Air Force Aid Society since then, and uh, it is a labor of love. Thank, thank you, sir. General Mason? Well, John, I do know John Cusick, good friend. Uh, I worked for him at one time, and then I commanded the same battalion in the great 82nd Airborne Division, the finest airborne division in the entire universe. <laughs> no, I love my brothers and sisters from the 101st uh, Fort Campbell. By the way, I'm reading the book uh, Bridge Too Far. It's really the movie. Nice. The movie was on last night, right? Yeah, I know. I was kind of in and out of that. The book and the movie are pretty close. So, who was the general? Wasn't it? It wasn't in Market Garden, but it was at Bastogne that said nuts. You remember yeah. who that was? Uh, he was no. the PCG of the 101st, McAuliffe. McAuliffe. I don't know if you guys know this story. You probably, and it's also in the movie Pat. So when the Battle of the Bulge, Germans uh, do this big counteroffensive, surround the city of Bastogne, which was a key transportation node. They are completely surrounded. And the Germans went in and sent a, an emissary in to ask the 101st if they wanted to, to um, give up, you know, surrender. And he had the General McAuliffe, who was the DCG Deputy Commanding General, had one answer. He said, nuts. Sent it back to the Germans. And they're like, was is das nuts? Was is yeah. So from then on, that was his, you know, that was his call sign. So great American. And, and you know, Patton's Third Army came in and relieved him. Anyway, um, very similar to John's pedigree and his background. Uh, my dad was in the Army for 30 years, World War II, Korea, Viet Vietnam, a couple of tours in Vietnam. Started off as a young enlisted soldier, made it up to uh, E6, got a battlefield commission, and then did his rest of his time as a commissioned officer. Uh, we moved all around the world, and uh, you know I have, I have a couple brothers and sisters, and we just had a blast. Uh, and so that kind of was in my blood. Went off to college here in Virginia at James Madison University. We've won a couple of football national championships. I played football there, but we weren't nearly that good back then. Uh, I went there because they had an AstroTurf Stadium, which I thought was really cool. Um, but anyway, so we started, a couple of us actually started ROTC at JMU. Um, and we were, you know, we're kind of looking for some extra money. And that program has just gone incredible since then. So came in the Army, uh, served all over the world, just like my dad, just like John did, series of assignments, some tough places like uh, Hawaii and Australia. Uh, really tough assignments, you know, but I got through them. Uh, obviously, a couple tours in combat. Um, and then, uh, you know, got selected for general officer uh, around 2000 and uh, did some time in Defense Logistics Agency, did some time um, back in Korea again, uh, Forces Command, different places. Ended up at the end of my time in the Army as the G4 of the Army. Uh, the, logist, the senior logistician working very closely with Army Tiro Command. And in that job, I was on the board of AFES. And it would flip between the A1 and the G4 to be the board chairs, co-chairs of, uh, of AFES. And that's when I got to know the team there. And that's when we hired Tom Scholl. And yes, you guys sir. probably know this, but we got over 300 applications for that position as it was converting from a general officer position 
to a, uh, a, a civilian position. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, and, and Tom's head will be a little bit big here, but <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, he rose right to the top. And as you guys know, even better than I do, what a great leader he is. And I think John would would certainly uh, weigh in on that. Uh, retired in 2014. In fact, what happened to me was the chief of staff of the Army, when you make three-star, I'm sure it's the same in the Air Force, you, the day you get promoted, they, the guy from General Officer Management Office hands you a letter and says, <clears throat> you are serving at the pleasure of the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff. At three years in grade, you will submit your retirement orders, uh, uh, retirement request, unless otherwise told by the Chief. So the Chief calls me up, General Odiero, about, I don't know, maybe about six months before my three years was up. And he goes, Ray, I love you like a brother, but I got nothing for you. Time to drop your papers. <laughs> I said, sir, don't worry about it. I'm probably three grades above where I should be. Uh, no problem. Anyway, great guy. One other quick story. So it, when I was on the Army staff, it was Ray Ordierno was the chief. Ray Chandler was the Sergeant Major of the Army. And there was Ray Mason. And when somebody was getting their butt chewed in the meeting, it wasn't Odierno and it wasn't Chandler. It was Ray. It was the third Ray. Um, Went out and did some commercial work for a while. And then uh, about three and a half years ago, Bob Foley, my predecessor, uh, Medal of Honor recipient, called me up and asked me if I was interested in throwing my name in the hat. And it was a dream come true. And every day is great. And I feel very honored and blessed to do what we do and serve with great folks like John and continue to work with the Atheist team. Over. <laughs> you said over. That's great. That's when we dry run. That's what we do too. We say over and I try really not hard not to say it when we're live. But you segued perfectly into our next discussion point, which is General Mason, can you tell us about Army Emergency Relief and its mission? Sure, sure. So Army Emergency Relief's been around 78 years. Uh, we were wow. stood up in 1942, if you do the math, uh, really by uh, George Marshall. George C. Marshall, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, the Marshall Plan, he was the Secretary of State, head of you know, the United Nations, a lot of things he did. Amazing individual. Um, so he stood it up and our mission statement that he gave us was to help relieve financial distress on the force. That was true in 1942, it's absolutely true today. As I mentioned earlier, we've got the headquarters, about 30 folks, we're really the synchronizers of the, of the mission but the real people that do the work every day are out in the field at over 70 locations. Uh, they're all employees and teammates of Installation Management Command, but they're under the operational control of AER headquarters. They're the ones every day talking to soldiers and families. Uh, as we do zero interest loans, grants or combinations, and educational scholarships. Of those categories, uh, every year we do about $70 million in assistance. Usually ends up being about $50 million in loans, zero interest, check static line, zero interest, um, or a grant or a combination thereof. And then, like I said, it's about usually about 10 million in grants and about 10 million in educational scholarships for spouses and children, 70 million bucks. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I'll turn it over to my, my brother, John. I was going right to that, General Hopper. Can you tell us a little bit about the Air Force Aid Society, sir? Sure, you bet. Um, it, 1942 must have been a good year. That's uh, when we got our start as well. And, and uh, coming from uh, Hap Arnold and uh, and his wife, uh, B, they uh, they were looking at the number of, of airmen casualties in uh, World War II. And, you know, every time one of those bombers went down, you're losing 10 or 13 crew members uh, at a go. And so their initial thrust for the Army Air Forces Relief Society was uh, to see how to educate the kids of those airmen that uh, that weren't coming back from World War II. So our initial thrust was education. We've been since evolved to there. We're really at the same point that AER. If we've got one dollar left, uh, that's probably going to go to emergency financial support. The uh, the Arnolds uh, shaped the society uh, early on by their personal interest and, uh, and frankly, by the interest of the people that were around them. Um, Hap Arnold spent a lot of time in the, Cal in the California area, in and around the entertainment industry. So in the early days, our board members included uh, names that may not mean much to most of you, uh, folks like uh, Arthur Godfrey, uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Major General Retired U.S. Air Force Reserve, James Stewart, um, 
the Watson uh, father and son, and Watson Jr. founded uh, IBM. Uh, we in fact had as part of our uh, treasure uh, copyrights to various books, uh, William Faulkner, one of the authors, several movies, lots of music. It's a fascinating thing to sort of look at the archives uh, wow. for the Air Force Aid Society. Uh, as we've grown up over time, as I said, the thrust has switched to emergency assistance. Uh, over any given year, we're at about $20 million or thereabouts uh, providing support. The highest for us recently was 2018, when we were about 21 and a half million or thereabouts. And uh, that's because we had a, a huge uh, spike from Hurricane uh, Michael when it uh, okay. uh, hammered uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. So. Uh, that was our single biggest outlay in a year of, of grants of six and a half million dollars uh, for those emergency assistance grants. Normally, we divide ours up with uh, no interest loans and grants, just as uh, as AER does. Uh, our education uh, uh, portfolio is about six million dollars, and then we do something called community enhancement programs for quality of life at our bases. That's about two million dollars, and then the rest in emergency assistance. That's where we are. Well, John went right over some really important point. And if we would go back to that, I think we'd all be much better. Remember, it was the Army Air Corps. And then you guys wanted to go out on your own and have your own little planes. But we should have kept it that way. <laughs> no, now that, now that you dragged me back there, I have to say thank you. Because we got some of our seed money, our startup money, from Army Emergency Relief. Been meaning to call you about that, John. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess I the good thing the good thing now is right. The Air Force now has a little brother or sister, right? The well, Space Force, Spacecom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly yeah. right. Space <laughs> the Space Force, and <clears throat> we of course support the Space Force now, and and uh, looking forward to formalizing that support going forward. <laughs> you see the little note from John Farrell. Yeah, <laughs> the money's gone. Thanks, John. That is funny. Wait, yeah. I'm sure of that, John. I'm going to look in your drawer. I bet in your bottom drawer, <laughs> you got some money that you army written on. So, so right, uh, a lot of Air Force members are probably familiar with the Falcon Loan, which is something the Air Force Aid Society provides. A lot of first sergeants, you know, you know, right. lean on that loan to provide to the young service members who need something to kind of get by. They have some financial difficulties. Um, and, of course, yeah. go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just going to say the Falcon Loan has been – huge for us. We, we started that in 2008. Uh, it, it's interesting how it evolved. Uh, we started it with $500 and we really didn't have anything to hang our hat on or what was the right amount. And so we really thought in terms of the unintended car repair that pops up. So $500 was probably not enough in 2008. <laughs> and so we, we progressively moved that to seven fifty, and now it's at a thousand dollars for the Falcon loan. But it's to it's to get that thing that just smacks you right between the eyes, and uh, and you there's no way you can you can kind of plan for it. But the other good part is uh, we believe the Falcon loan has significantly reduced the future stress because it's nipped some problems in the bud, and uh, and so it's had a very positive effect for us. Wow, that's that's awesome. Um, let me segue into this next question here. As you're all aware, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Can you speak to why your agencies are so important to military communities, especially now? And also, have you, have you seen an uptick in, in maybe requests for, for help during this time? John, you want to go? You want me to go? Yeah, I, I just finished talking, Ray, so I'll let you go first. All right. Yeah, so obviously this is uh, somewhat unique and un precedented in our nation's history and global history. Although I would say that we as a nation, we as a human race have gone through some pretty tough times in the past as well. You know, we kind of look at our time right now and go, oh my golly, this is, you know, just overwhelming. But you think about the Great Depression, you think about World War II, you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, obviously those had, those were packaged or had feelings to them. But and one of the toughest things about this is we don't know where the end state is. But World War II, you know, they didn't know where that was going either. But anyway, so yeah, so when uh, when basically things started uh, ticking up in terms of stay-at-home orders, uh, quarantines, shelter in place, all those kinds of things, uh, about mid-March, we made a decision to, here at AER headquarters, to go 
teleworking and we put that in place uh, and we put we put in place an online application on our website and the ability to conduct electronic funds transfers. Therefore, a soldier or family member would not have to come physically to an office. Although a number of probably 30 to 40% of our offices have stayed in the field, you know, we've got about 70 of them, have stayed open to one extent or another. But again, to protect everybody. And that's worked very well, frankly. And we're doing all of our meetings through Zoom like this, or <laughs> Facebook Live, or Teams, which has worked very well for us. Uh, we've also expanded the different kinds of categories uh, that people, you know, we have over 30 categories in AER. John mentioned the number one, which is usually car repair. Right after that is rent and deposit on the rent. But we started looking at things as, you know, training that was canceled, people's PCSs that were canceled. We put a homeschooling program in place where, where families could get supplies through a loan or a grant through us. Uh, unfortunately, we also have a program for uh, when, a, when a, you lose a loved one and they can't conduct the funeral right away and you've got to keep them in dignified storage, either at the hospital or at the funeral home, that can become very expensive and can, mm -hmm. can last weeks, if not months. We've got a program to assist with those costs. We also expanded our eligibility extensively to reserve and National Guard. Uh, uh, Active Guard Reserve are already fully eligible. Uh, Reserve and National Guard that are brought on to active duty on the 31st day, they become eligible. We waive that 31 days. We also uh, title 32 National Guard soldiers that are, are in support of COVID-19. They became eligible for AER kinds of support. Uh, we had a lot of Reserve and National Guards that weren't able to make their family and group life insurance and their TRICARE premiums. We provided uh, funds for that as well because we don't want them to lose their, their insurance both medical and, and life insurance. So we've been expanding that. Now, be honest with you, um, the demand has not quite materialized as, as much as we thought it would be. And I think John will probably share his data and very similar. Uh, the other relief agencies, Navy, Marine, and Coast Guard, very similar. And we think there's kind of four things going on that have caused the demand not to grow quite yet, but we think it's coming. One is, uh, you know, everybody kind of hunkered down. Mm -hmm. weren't driving, weren't going on vacations, weren't eating out, weren't doing different things where you experience costs. PCSs weren't happening. Every, all, everybody had kind of stuck over where you are. And those are usually where a lot of our demand and assistance mm -hmm. generated. The CARES Act provided certainly a cushion for families of all the services, the checks they got from the government. Uh, most military families keep a month to three months of rainy day kind of funds. And I think that has had some impact on uh, them being able to weather some of this storm. And then I think they really haven't truly realized the full impact yet. But we think P PC Army's starting to PCS again, and people are out. You know, a little bit like the dynamic with your insurance company, where they gave a lot of people rebates because people weren't having car accidents. So anyway, uh, we're prepared to deal with that demand if it went, when and if it comes. Um, and we've got the funds to do it. So what I tell the Army team is, look, Whatever's happened in your life, life happens. Come to AER, come see us, come on the internet, come on the website. Even though we've got 30 categories of assistance, if it's something that you're dealing with, you come to us. We turn away less than 1% of the people that come to us for a need. So that's kind of where we are and we're prepared to handle uh, whatever the future brings. Oh. So it's as, it's as simple as that. Just go into your website if someone needs relief. Any soldiers out there maybe need some assistance. www.armyemergencyrelief.org or you can just type in AER. It'll also get you there. Got, got it, got it. How about you, sir? General Hopper? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to be repetitive, but General Mason said it, uh, said it very well. We, we operate, of course, through the Airmen and Family Readiness Centers on our bases. And so we maintain uh, that operational capability throughout the crisis so far. And frankly, I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised that the bases uh, themselves were able to do that. We monitor that uh, on a daily basis. And so far, we've only had one base that the Airmen and Family Readiness Center uh, was not able to stay open and, uh, and, uh, and help our families. Uh, I am envious of the uh, of the online capability at AER <clears throat> and uh, uh, their ability to do that. Also, the the electronic payments we can do the electronic payment payments. Uh, it's a little bit of a brute force 
uh, sort of operation for us. That's it's not an elegant sort of thing. Uh, frankly, we are stealing ideas, and we'll be better at that uh, the next time we have to use that. The 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 thing that I would really uh, stop on is is uh, what General Mason said about the categories of support. I mean, <clears throat> we probably have more categories of support that well, 30 for Army Emergency Relief, it, something like that for us as well. Uh, but but the point is, if if an airman uh, needs help, uh, they just simply have to come to us, and uh, don't uh, don't opt out because if you think it's something that that we won't help you do. Uh, we just encourage you to come and say, can we work through this problem together? Because oftentimes, <clears throat> what we pass out as much as anything are good ideas about how to how to uh, how to treat the situation that uh, that you're in. So. Uh, it's kind of give us a chance to do that. I, I feel a little bit like uh, the sky is falling uh, character uh, because it, uh, our, our demand has been surprisingly low. But again, as General Mason pointed out, the structure implemented by both federal and local governments has, uh, has really, uh, I think, been very supportive uh, of the American public in general. Uh, but it does, I believe, mask uh, some issues that may be out there that will occur later on. And for those, we feel like we're primed and ready to address those when, when they do surface. The thing that really concerns me is uh, we're about to enter uh, the time of year when we all hold our breath, and that's hurricane season. Yep. I, I can't quite imagine what would happen uh, if we are hit by one of those really bad storms, uh, and they're predicted uh, to have uh, several hurricanes that will make landfall in this, in this season. So we stand ready to support airmen to, when they do that. And, and one of the things, of course, that I think most people know, but if they don't, is that this is a mutually supportive operation. So if an airman can't get to an airman and family readiness center, he can certainly go to, to, to an army post that's right there or to a Navy station and uh, the American Red Cross. And uh, they, that uh, the support for them will flow uh, through some various channels, but it will come from the Air Force Aid Society. And the same thing for soldiers and sailors coming to us uh, to get some help as well. Yeah, what John said jogged my memory, Chief. So just a second, a um, couple things. One is American Red Cross is critical. They're, they're kind of the safety net. By the way, let me just give the phone number because they run call centers around the United States. So it's two o'clock in the morning. You're going somewhere as a military member. Your car breaks down. You got to get some cash. Uh, it's 877-272-272. 7337, call them. As John said, the money will still come from the original service, whatever service you're from, but they're really a magnificent partner. And again, if a soldier's at an air base, go into the, the air support, Airman Support Center, or if a, if, a, um, if a sailor's at an Army base, they come into the Army Community Service where AER is. But one other thing, so John mentioned his Falcon loans, and that is such a cool name. We call ours the Who Alone. <laughs> no, we really don't. We really don't. I wish we, I wish we had a cool name like John does, but we don't. We call ours the Quick Assist Program. And okay. with that is very similar to what John had. We kind of stole the idea from him. Uh, it is any company commander or first sergeant in the Army uh, can approve a loan up to $2,000 off their signature. And we want it to be quick. Uh, it could be a 10-minute conversation. Uh, the soldier sits down, you know, again, with the first sergeant. Uh, or the company commander with their chain of command, hey, this is my problem, I got a car broken down, I need $800, okay, let me see the bill, let me see your driver's license, your insurance, your registration, all good to go, okay, young man, young lady, here you go, go down to AER, get your 800 bucks. It can be that quick. It's very similar to that Falcon loan and it's pretty cool. So uh, we all have similar programs like that. Back to you, Chief. Wow, that, hey, that's that's great. I know you you both mentioned about thirty instances, not all inclusive of situations where people come and get relief. Can you tell us more? You know, with, with the upcoming school season coming up, I don't know if people are, are are you know virtually go to go to school, or if you're in Texas or Florida, half of them might physically go to school or virtual. Can you tell us more about the homeschooling education grant? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll go uh, I'll go first this time. <clears throat> and I have to start with uh, with an old saying: "No good idea is not worth stealing." <laughs> and, uh, so we uh, we uh, stole uh, this process uh, from Army Emergency Relief, who I think themselves may have 
lifted it from Coast Guard mutual assistance. But yeah, uh, plagiarizing, which got the, me through college. So that's, the, <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> but uh, it, it, we think that it's it's one way that that we can help families <clears throat> in a situation that uh, it just really continues to evolve. Uh, they don't know uh, right now uh, in many places whether their schools are going to open, uh, whether they're going to have virtual schooling full time, virtual schooling two days a week, and in in person schooling. Uh, three days a week, and, and frankly, uh, it leaves them wondering a bit. So we want to be able to relieve some of that burden for them and, and frankly, help out the teachers as well because a lot of what the supplies that we imagine that will be purchased with these grants are what, uh, what our great teachers, in fact, spend out of pocket sometimes to bring in the classroom. So we're looking forward to, uh, to rolling out a program, and it's probably, we're probably about a uh, month away, although the staff, we debated uh, internally many times what the right rollout date is so that uh, we can uh, get maximum exposure for those trying to make the decisions uh, as they start back to school. So we think we're about a month or so away from uh, from being able to roll that out. And uh, um, it, it's gonna be a great program and, and we're looking forward to being able to support those families. K through 12, I should say for us, right. K through 12. Yeah. So let, let me give a shout out to Kerry Thomas, Admiral Kerry Thomas from the Coast Guard. So as John said, uh, no good idea, too good to steal. So I got it from Kerry and John got it from me. And that kind of shows the jointness of this organization and how, how we all are one team, one fight kind of thing. Very similar to what John just described. We've had ours around for about uh, two months now. It's up to $500, uh, can be a loan, a grant, or a combination. Uh, you know, it kind of goes the, the industrial age, pens, papers, you know, pencils, but it also can include digital stuff, computers, tablets, Wi-Fi connections, those kinds of things. One of the things we did is normally we don't do retroactive assistance because if the emergency has passed or your issues passed and you've taken care of it, you no longer have that need. But in this case, we decided to make it retroactive back to one March uh, when we put it in place, like again, about 45 days ago, because that's when people started feeling the pain. Uh, as John said, we'll see what happens this year, but we're going to keep the program around as long as it's needed. Um, and I want to do a shout out to my AP's teammates. So you'll get on today uh, at AP's locations. There'll be a flyer near those kinds of supplies. It has the old Q code on it with your phone. You walk up through that. It's going to show you exactly what supplies uh, are available for this program and it pretty much runs the gamut uh, and hopefully that's a win-win for the soldier and a win-win for APs and AER so uh, John and I talked about it before we came on the net so that might be something John that makes sense that we do a dual flyer or something but um, yeah we're excited about this it's the right thing to do and uh, you know it, it's tough being at home you know with those kids but you know I, so a lot of my you know teammates have children at home and for the first couple of weeks, they're like, this is so awesome. I don't get, I get to spend all this time with my kids. And now they're like, <laughs> when are they going back to school? <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's all good. Yeah. What, one more pile on, and I think General Mason and AER has this as well there. There's a possibility of some big expenses uh, out there as well, or, or more significant expenses if, if the family doesn't have a, a computer. Uh, for the kids to work on and, and uh, if that's a need, they need to come to us because it, it won't be out of the grant necessarily, uh, but as a separate request and we can work those things as well. By, by the way, thank you. I'm glad you said that, John, because we're actually reviewing our program right now. We're looking at raising the dollar figure uh, because we're seeing the demands a little bit higher than 500, particularly if you're talking a tablet or a computer. And uh, we're also looking at potentially folks that have been homeschooling for years and we're working our way through what what's equitable for everybody uh, on this. It was originally designed uh, just for those that, that got impacted by COVID-19, but we're looking at a broader option and we should have some information out on that soon. I'm also really glad that you brought up the exchange and our partnership with you. Since 2017, the exchange has been helping your agencies during specified donation periods and more than $800,000 has been donated during our partnership with you. But we have exciting news on how we've expanded to year round giving at the register and online. What can you share with us um, 
General Mason, General Hopper about about this and what it means to your agencies to have the support. Go ahead, John. Yeah, sure. It, you know, um, it, it, it really is hard to describe because I've, I've been in this job for 15 years now. And I remember uh, going in the uh, uh, Marine Corps exchange at Henderson Hall and seeing a flyer for Navy Marine Corps relief and then talking with AFES about that. And uh, lots of folks wanted to help, but it was impossible to move the mechanics of the systems, particularly at the point of sale at the cash register, mm -hmm. to, to do something like that. And so uh, the fact that we are there now is, is, uh, is really just, it's amazing. Uh, it's a tribute to the flexibility and the hard work, starting with Tom Scholl, but really extending through the rest of the staff because it's, it, uh, we understand it's a stretch. And for, for us at Air Force Aid, we, we have three partners that are with us because the donation is to what's called the Air Force Assistance Fund. Mm -hmm. And that fund supports not just the Air Force Aid Society, but it supports our enlisted uh, village, uh, our Air Force Village and, and uh, the LeMay Foundation. So three other charities that support retired airmen, uh, most of whom uh, need some help uh, to be able to, uh, to live there. Uh, so it's, it's a great supporter uh, for the Air Force Aid Society. And my hat is off to, to AFES. And you just frankly continue to innovate. Uh, the, uh, I, I love the idea about the flyers. Uh, it, it's just really terrific for us. So hats off to you and thanks. Yeah, at the, risk, Shut at the up. risk of a 15-yard penalty for piling on, um, <laughs> let me also do a shout out for certainly Tom Scholl, Anna Middleton, and the whole, the whole, all the associates at, at AFI's headquarters, but also at your locations around the world and in the combat zone, which uh, AFI's is always there. Uh, very early in a in a shooting war, you guys are right there, and much appreciated. Um, yeah, so when I called Tom a couple of years back and said we've got a challenge with communication, trying to tell military members about our capability. Tom said, I can help you with that. And I bet I can also help you generate some funds. I said, talk to me, talk to me, Tom. And it really, you guys came up with the idea of the give and get back uh, campaign, you know, donate five bucks, get five bucks off a $25 purchase, mad, magic, just magic. And then the point of sale thing, and, and that is John has laid that out, and that has already generated significant dollars. And it's, you know, it's folks at the register, uh, doing the right thing and trying to give back to their brothers and sisters and you know active retired reserve national guard across the board veterans can order on your online on your website yep. that happened recently i know we started working that when i was on the board you know we finally yes. got it through and tom perseverance <laughs> made it happen that's a wonderful thing for veterans uh you know i can remember as a kid john may remember this too you know my dad would bring home the AFES catalog Back in those days, remember that? Absolutely. I mean, it was about two inches thick, and it had everything in it. I mean, I was like, wow, this is what I want for Christmas. <laughs> and it the toy section. Remember, it had national, it had international sections like the Asian section and the European section. And Man, it, it had stereos galore. It was the coolest thing. <laughs> you guys need to bring that catalog back. <laughs> I'm going to go look for one. I'm going to go look for one in a building. I'm sure we have one somewhere. We have them in the archives. We yeah, do. There, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll mail you one. We're going to mail you one. <laughs> I need to be in the archives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that does bring back some, brings back some memories. I remember paging through for those stationed in the Pacific and yep. just being envious of all the stereo and camera gear that they could order that, that uh, that uh, the rest of us could not at, at a great price that the rest of us could not. But I'll uh, tell a quick quick AFI story. I'm a second lieutenant in Germany. I've just gotten all my pay. I got a stack of twenties about this high. My brand new bride, who I had married two weeks earlier, wasn't in Germany with me yet. I, I had all that money burning the hole in my pocket. I went down to a place called Mainz Castell, which was like the biggest PX in the world, bigger than than Ramstein is now. It had four buildings of stereos. I bought the <laughs> biggest stereo you've ever seen. 12 foot speakers, reel to reels, amps, preamps. Took it home, set it all up. Next week, I picked my wife up at the airport. She walked into our apartment. She goes, That's all out of here. <laughs> I go, but honey, don't you remember in college? We all wanted it. And she looks at me and goes, We're not in college anymore. Oh. oh. <laughs> 
That is that is a great story. <laughs> I, re I remember that on the, a true story <laughs> on the <laughs> other end of that, uh, waiting for my dad on payday, and all of us, my dad, my 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 brother, my mother, and I, and he would be something with the paymaster, and he would wear he would wear his pistol that day. Yep. Hey, man! Uh, and uh, soldiers would come through the line, and and I mean physically get uh, paid with dollars there and, and walk out the door. So the analogy of burning a hole in your pocket uh, is very apt. I'm trying to remember if they got paid in U.S. I think they got paid in script. It depends, uh, yeah, where you were. But, yeah, yeah. I get my first probably year in the Army, we got paid cash, which is a mistake. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they tell me that's why the allotment system was born. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The exactly. spouses said that's a mistake. <laughs> Uh, wow, great stories. Thank you so much for sharing them. And of course, you know, the exchange team, they always, you know, try to do their best to support, especially, you know, the worthy charities that, that both your organizations have. They're always there to support the airmen and soldiers and of course the family members. So, so keep it up. Thank you so much. And of course, shout out to all the exchange associates at the headquarters buildings and throughout the field, you know, trying to make this happen for these agencies. Um, so it's been a challenging year for many of us and many people are looking for light at the end of the tunnel. What advice do the both of you have for the airmen, soldiers, and military families as they look toward brighter days ahead? John, I'll let you go and then. Okay. Well, um, I, for, for military members and their families, my, my advice is, is staying the course, continue to do what you do, um, because although we see the family sometimes under uh, stress, Military families are, uh, um, they are the heart of America. Uh, the military member uh, focusing on the mission, uh, supported by, uh, maybe alone, without a spouse, but many times supported by a spouse and family. Uh, it is a, a unit, uh, a cohesive sort of thing uh, that supports the, the rest of what we do. And... Um, our job is to make sure that they can continue to, to operate and feel that way and, and, uh, and frankly, support the rest of us. Uh, defending freedom and far-flung paces is, is something that, that they do all the time. And uh, if we can uh, be supportive of that, uh, that's what we should do. And that's what we encourage when they need a little bit of help. Uh, please, uh, don't be shy. It, that's what we want to do. And that's why we're there. So come see us. Yeah. Well said, John, I, I give two kind of closing thoughts. One is, and it's really a, uh, an audible off what John said. So um, look, asking for help is a sign of strength. It's a sign of resiliency. So don't, don't struggle with it yourself. We've got lots of capabilities on our military bases to assist with all manner of things. Life happens and it throws you some curves, right? just like that Rascal Flat song. And so we're out here to, to help with some of those things. We can't solve all problems, wouldn't profess to do that, but we can help with some financial assistance. We can help with some financial counseling, get you back on your feet, and you will see that light at the end of the tunnel. I'll kind of finish with a, what I consider probably one of the most inspirational events in my lifetime and in my military career. So most of us know that when we started our operations in, our, in Afghanistan and Iraq, for every fallen comrade's funeral, we would send a general officer to represent the secretary at that, at that funeral. And I did way too many of them. But I was at the representing the secretary at a young E-5's funeral uh, up in uh, near Fort Drum. He was in the 10th Mountain and I was meeting his family and his mom. He had a twin brother, identical twin. This young man was 21 years old, corporal, was in the turret of a uh, Humvee when it got hit by an IED. And so I got to know this family over two days and, and just the strength of the family and the strength of the community and, you know, all the people that gathered around them, just amazing. But what struck me was, is I knelt down and I'm probably going to get a little emotional here. And I, <clears throat> I handed the nation's colors to this mom. She looked up at me with the most powerful eyes I think I've ever seen and just said, look, Dale died doing exactly what he always wanted to do. 
He wanted to be a soldier since he was 10 years old. And so I have no regrets. I couldn't do anything about his death. But you tell all the men and women that you're serving with that I'm praying for. Now, just let that wash over you. Here's a woman who's just lost her child. I have two children. I cannot imagine what it's like to lose a child. So when something like this happens to her or to us, we lose a loved one or we go through the trauma that we're going through right now and the ups and downs of it, it rips a hole in your heart. And you can't do much about that. We can't do much about COVID. But what we can do and we should do is decide what are we going to fill that hole in our heart with? Is it going to be hope and faith and forgiveness and love? Or as she had done, or is it going to be anger and anxiety and all the other things that are the tough side of life? You decide what you're going to fill it with. That's why I'm optimistic because a lady like that, a woman like that, of power, uh, saw the bright light at that end of that tunnel you were talking about, Chief, and it's there. We don't know when it's going to be there, but it'll be there. It'll always be there. And I'm convinced that our leaders in the military, our local, state, and national leaders will get us through it. But more importantly, the individual citizen, their resiliency, not only Americans, but around the globe. So I'm optimistic. Um, there's going to be probably some more tough times ahead. And as John mentioned, hurricanes, you know, are probably out there. But we'll get through it. We've done it before. We've faced tough times before and we'll get through this too because of, you know, the human spirit is infinitesimal. That's what I have to wow. say about that. Great. Well wow, said. Great. Well, yeah, well said. Definitely well said. Uh, I appreciate those words. And of course, right, stay positive, have a positive attitude, stay optimistic, and, and look at the glass half full. And we should be all right. Let me get a. Uh, General Hopper, another question for you here, sir, right? Your, your successor has been named. It's the current Chief Master on the Air Force. What words of advice do you have for him? You, you know, I'm not sure that I have any really great words of advice. I, I, I snuck into a, I don't know if it was a Teams or a Zoom meeting that my staff was having. They didn't know I was on it. Mm -hmm. They were saying something about how great it's going to be to get rid of the old age and treachery and welcome the youthful enthusiasm and vigor. Of, of Chief Wright, so I I was taken aback by that a little bit, but I <clears throat> Chief Wright is uh, is a terrific leader, uh, proven leader, and uh, he understands uh, our airmen, uh, understands their interest, and uh, is dedicated to to looking out for their interest. So uh, the only thing I would offer is is really. Um, it's sort of like the change of command. You're, you're envious because the person that's coming in to take the command is about to have the most rewarding experience uh, probably of their lives. Uh, Chief Wright will enjoy that, I believe, but he will also bring to this fight uh, the sort of passion, the sort of understanding, uh, the sort of innovation that uh, very similar to what General Mason just, just mentioned. And so uh, if I could offer anything to Chief Wright, that, that would be it. Uh, I think the Air Force Aid Society is in, in for great experience. And I think our airmen and uh, our families are in for some great support. We're going to miss you, John. Well, I appreciate that, Ray. Thanks. Now you're going to get me teared up. Just tell us when the keg party is. Yeah, <laughs> this ain't college, General Mason. <laughs> you sound like my wife. <laughs> Need to issue a mascara alert for this yeah. program today. Yeah. Like y'all both have me like, oh, geez. <laughs> Is there anything, um, can you guys, sorry, you guys, General Hopper, General Mason, can you share where viewers can go online to find out more, to learn more about you, and to get help if they need it. Like you said, it's a, it's a sign of strength, not weakness, to admit that you need a hand up sometimes. Well, to find out more about me, you can go onto Google. It's pretty frightening, actually. But, uh, <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, no, I mentioned earlier, but let me do it again. So easiest place to go 
is to our website, the old www.armyemergencyrelief, all kind of one word, mm -hmm. .org, or you can just type in AER, it'll get you there as well. And uh, I, I would say one last thing. This is the second best job I've ever had in my life. People say, okay, well, what was the best? Yeah, what was the best? Being a battalion commander in the great 82nd Airborne Division. Pretty tough to beat that. But this is right <laughs> there with it. Airborne. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, General Mason, I, that, you, you are so spot on with that. And I think that's why I mentioned changing command with, with Chief Wright. That, that, that 05 command is, uh, there is just nothing quite like that. And uh, perhaps the last time I, I think I knew what I was doing, but maybe that's part of it as well. But hey, you can get a hold of us by going to afas.org. And uh, that should get you pretty much wherever you want to go. But if you want to go to Facebook, it's at Air Force Aid Society, or Twitter is at AFASHQ. Um, Instagram, I'm not a good Instagrammer, but they gave me the, <laughs> the Instagram. Uh, uh, share it, share it. Entry, sure. It's AFAS underscore HQ. Uh, the, the last thing I push, though, is we do have a podcast. Uh, that we've been doing. Uh, we're just about at the end of our, our first series. And uh, I'd ask everybody to, to be on the lookout because we're going to feature uh, Chief Bob Gaylor. Uh, oh, great. Chief, oh, that's good. For those that know him, the fifth Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force and, and just one of the really, really great airmen out there. So we're looking forward You're going to have a lot of stories on that show. There could be some stories yeah. on, on that <laughs> wow. show. You know, the irony, Chief, and I'll, I'll stop with this, is I didn't even realize early in my career, I was the first lieutenant flying C-130s in Southeast Asia and really flying out of CCK Air Base in Taiwan. And uh, Master Sergeant Jim Benneker was assigned there at the same time, along with Airman First Class Eric Benkin, two oh, few wow. Master Sergeants of the Air Force uh, right there at the same time at CCK. So uh, That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It really wow. is. Wow. What but thanks, thanks, that? thanks, APs, for the opportunity to, to be with you today, it's, and, and certainly with General Mason. Yeah, and, and we're on all that digital madness as well. You know, <laughs> snap face and all that stuff, we're on that too. I don't know what all the codes are, but you just come there and you look at our website, it's all on there. I don't know what all that stuff means. I'm sure it's important. No, I'm just well, kidding. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> APs team. Julie, Chief. Thank you. Leah, Everybody, John Farrell, thanks for keeping us all. Keep, ah, you're the, uh, the truth sayer there. <laughs> Great notes. Thank you. Thank you, General Mason and General Hopper. Thanks again for spending some time with us today. It truly is an honor to talk with the yeah. both of you. We appreciate your support. Thank you for all that you do for the airmen, soldiers, and military families. With that, exchange out. Out. <laughs>